All righty. So News of the Week episode on this Wednesday afternoon, and I'm doing this a little early because I have to go somewhere in just a bit. And as I said in my review of the CONCACAF Champions Cup game from yesterday, it's going to be the same thing. In terms of tonight's game, I'm going to do the review of both of those games uh, tomorrow. But that being said, we did see one trade that happened in MLS this week, and that, of course, is Inter Miami. Because, of course, it involves Inter Remind me, uh, they have traded DeAndre Yetland to FC Cincinnati in exchange for $172,799 of general allocation money. And the reason why I decided to put the exact number is because on the league website, this was literally the exact number that the general allocation money that FC Cincinnati uh, pay Inter Miami in order to get DeAndre Yetland. And I think this is the first time I've seen a team that literally exactly put the, the amount of of general allocation money to the other team to acquire a player. Usually, they basically round up and and so forth. But yeah, this is kind of interesting in that, you know, obviously Inter Miami, as I'll talk about in a bit, they are looking to get another big signing uh, down in South America and especially from the, the Brazilian League because it feels like this year, MLS and the Brazilian League has an unofficial partnership since there's so many transfer in and out of that, that league. So uh, they also had to make some space in the cap Room, which again, I think this is going to be something that's going to infuriate a lot of fans of asking how in the world does Inter Miami still have cap space, especially what happened in the beginning of the season where they had to sell some pieces to comply with roster rule. But getting the, rid of DeAndre Yetlin definitely dumped uh, some of that 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 salary off of the the cap. I mean, I'm not saying that DeAndre Yetlin is a, a bad player. I mean, I think he was okay during his time in Inter Miami, especially. Uh, down the stretch and you know Cincinnati getting another death pieces and especially not doesn't have to pay too much about I think that's a pretty cheap price to to be able to acquire DeAndre Yetlin but knowing to remind me need, need some some cap space as a, a player that I'll mention in in just bit that they're looking to, to sign uh, this is kind of almost like a roster dump move so that they can of course give uh, another player uh, or give uh, their one of their player to another team, uh, and get get at least some sort of general allocation money in return of that. Now, CF Montreal and Minnesota, of course, both have signed defenders that that they of course drafted uh, in the super draft. So uh, Grayson Doty is one of the players that CF Montreal drafted, and now he has signed a professional contract. And the same goes for Hugo Bakarich. Uh, Minnesota, of course, have now signed him to an official contract. And we'll see how both of these players is going to do. Usually, when it comes to uh, defenders uh, that is coming out of college, we don't usually see a, a lot of, of players that come out of college, especially in the Super Draft, that, that they, of course, are implemented into the system right away. Now, there are some exceptions. We have seen some gems that are found in the Super Draft. And as Orlando City will tell you, yeah, those two guys that they found in, in the draft, in Daryl DK and... And Duncan McGuire, yeah, they, they were definitely gems that turns out to be be huge where they can even sell them off for a big amount of money. But that being said, for most part, a lot of the super draft picks that teams, of course, use are getting guys that are just more more or so just kind of death pieces for their team. And I think that's kind of the same case for both of these teams in the same situation. Montreal getting Grace and Dottie just for, for, for some, some death piece. And the same goes for Minnesota United getting more depth in terms of the defense. I mean, they have really revamped their back line this, this uh, off season. Well, I would say revamp, but they still have problems in terms of the fullback position. There's still question mark uh, all, all of that spot uh, as the season goes along. But at least in terms of the center-back partnership, they've definitely replenished the depth and has gotten much young, younger compared to previous season. Now, Inter Miami, uh, going back to what I said about how they decided to trade DeAndre Yetlin to shred some of the 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 caps or open up some of the cap space that they'll get well it's because they're looking to try to sign Matias rojas from corinthians and they're also shredding even more cap, cap space uh in order to acquire Matias rojas as they decided to announce that they're going to sell john mota to brazilian side victoria now when they decided to sell gregory i, I fought uh, that was kind of a surprising move, but also a move that they kind of almost are forced to, to do so because they want to comply with roster rule. But at least I thought, well, at least they still have John Mota there in in the, the midfield and, and, and they're still being in the good hands because of it. I didn't think they were also thinking about selling John Mota too. And I, I think, you know, with getting 
this guy from Corinthians. From what I heard, you know, he was okay, okay during his time with Corinthians. Even some have said that he kind of turned out to be a flop uh, with Corinthians. And we'll see what, whether if he can improve as he comes into Miami. And I'm also going to assume that this is a direct replacement uh, for John Mota as well. Because you don't just sell two uh, of your best midfielder, especially two of your best defensive midfielder, and decide to get, get another player that doesn't play in that same spot. I heard that some people said that Mateus Rojas is a central attacking midfielder, which if that's the case, I mean, this move doesn't kind of make sense for Inter Miami because they've just got Federico Redondo uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago. So why in the world do they need to, to lower on a, another central attacking midfielder? But in my opinion, I think most likely he's probably going to play in that same spot that John Malta had is playing. And again, you know, this... As much as I, I know some said that this is kind of a big name coming out of South America, especially from, from the players that, that is part of one of the biggest team in South America, this is a bit of a risky kind, kind of move, I think, in my opinion, with, with Inter Miami. Especially, you know, I, I mentioned both Gregory and John Mota. All of these players were very good with Inter Miami. They really didn't need to move on from him to get a, a piece that, to, to, to this day, we'll, we'll see how he's get, going to do, especially, you know, if... If it is true that he didn't really perform well with Corinthians, I think Inter Miami is going to have regrets that that they probably shouldn't have sell uh, John Mota in in the first place, and also not to mention uh, selling DeAndre Yet Yetlin as well. And this is also where it kind of creates another problem. Where well, how are they going to have enough cap space to maybe find a replacement for DeAndre Yetlin? Because uh, the 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 salary need that Mateus Rojas is going to to uh, eat up in the cap space that Inter Miami has, it's going to be pretty close in terms of them once again slam right above, above the cap. And that the fact that they decided to do that, and now they, they have a hole in that right back position, and not to mention defense, is still a, a, a weakness, I think, uh, I'll say about this Inter Miami team. I mean, don't let that Orlando City performance fool you the fact that I still think there I am still a little concerned about the, the defense of this team. Yeah, again, you know, this is a very interesting decision and we'll see whether of course will work out i mean watch out it's gonna work worked out to to a treat and they, they they're, they're just gonna go through the approach of what's defense i mean we got all the attacking talent we need we, we're just gonna keep outscoring the opponent left and right but from my experience or at least from what i've seen with, with with teams really a lot of these teams that have been successful uh they need to still have a good good solid back line i mean you could argue maybe columbus was was an exception to that because they really kind of brute forced their way because of that high end attacking talent. But I would argue that Columbus definitely established themselves to have a really good defense structure as the season goes along. And I can't say the same thing about Inter Miami unless if, if that's going to improve as the season goes along. Now, there's a report suggesting coming out of Mexico that Carlos Vela to the Quakes that we have heard from earlier week, well, it looked like that's not going to happen as the talk has been broken down and there is still a chance that he could be re-signed with LAFC. Now, also not surprised the fact that, you know, the talk of Carlos Vela to the Quakes uh, eventually broke down because if there's one thing you know about the Quakes and if there's one thing you know about the owner of, of the Quakes, which is the same owner that owns the, the A's and basically are moving, moving them, to Las Vegas amidst all the black backlash that's going on, especially with Ace fans in, in Oakland. This is not a big surprise that the Quakes decided, decided that that they can't get Carlos Vela and that, you know, that that's kind of the, the, the reason why a lot of Quakes fans has been very frustrated with this team and the, the Fisher out campaign is at its full voice because, you know, I've said this before and I'll say it again, unless if John Fisher eventually does not sell this team, Quakes will never be a competitive team. No matter what they ha have, have tried to do and what kind of signing that they have, John Fisher is clearly the one that is holding back back this this team. And that that yeah, this this was a chance for them to get a big name name. And while I know Vela is not the same player as he was a couple of years ago, and this kind of maybe be a very similar situation of when Montreal decided to get Joseph Martinez. But in terms of marketing reason, Carlos Vela is a big big name, and especially to appeal to the L3 fan fan base in, in northern california as well and get get people to show up in the stadium this would be a good way uh to do so and not to mention even though i know vela is not the same player as he was a couple years ago he still put up a decent amount amount uh, of numbers now probably not decent amount of numbers in terms of the quakes decided to make him a dp player which is what i originally thought that they were going to do but still yeah again this is not a big surprise that eventually the team 
talk has broken down. And maybe you could also say that this is kind of almost just, just use as leverage to, to make sure LAFC that, hey, you know, if you're going to re-sign him, you better make sure that you give, keep him as a DP tag and ba basically give him the money that he, he deserves. And, you know, this is where LAFC does have that dilemma because, yes, they, they want to keep Carlos Vela back, but the or, or they want to have Carlos Vela back to this team. But the problem is the contract that, that that Carlos Vela demand LAFC to give him, that's just not not realistic to a point where where his performance again just have not been been good he's he's definitely winding down uh his career as he now approach 35 years old and there's no way in hell lafc is going to 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 uh, match what carlos Vela want, wants which is him remains a designated player and especially the contract that 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 he he, he wanted and maybe that's also kind of what the quakes are think, thinking too is that yeah you know well it's great that we can br bring a big name to our our team yeah, you know, I think it's a bit risky to make him a DP kind of player, player especially if we kind of overpay pay him for, for a certain amount. It, it could be one of the, the, those DP tag that, you know, uh, the Quakes have always signed some re really bad designated players in, in the past, and this could be, be one of them if they if, if Carlos Vela doesn't live up to his bargain or, or just getting to a point where he, he pretty much doesn't have enough, enough uh, to, to, to generate the, the, the numbers. That you would say that it's it, it deserved to be be label him as a designated player. Now speaking of DP players, uh, the Portland Timbers they've been chasing hard in terms of getting that DP number nine, and there's a couple of reports that they're going to go down to Liga Emekis as a place that they're going to sign their DP number nine, and it starts off with them rumored to to offer fifteen million dollar to sign Monterey. Uh, for Herman Betarame, and then they're also uh, linked with Club America for Jonathan Capista Rodriguez. Now, out of those two players that I've mentioned, there's no doubt that Betarame is a better option compared to Jonathan Capista uh, Rodriguez, because at least from what I heard about Club America fan, uh, Jonathan Capista uh, Rodriguez is not the same player that he was a couple years ago. In fact, his performance has really dwindled down to a point where you can even say that he's he's a bit washed up um, in terms of his, his term form. Whereas for Herman Bederame, I mean, you know, ever since Brandon Vasquez has arrived, the Riados, I mean, he has really kind of been the, the main number nine for, for this Monterey team. But Herman Bederame is still kind of used as, as that, that second striker. And not to mention, as what we saw last, last year in, in the Leeds Cup, uh, and especially... Uh, of him just kind of just single-handedly destroyed the Seattle Sounders in that Leeds Cup uh, match. It's going to be a good deal uh, for the, the, the Timbers. Now, what will not be a good deal is the fact that they're offering $15 million. I mean, that is a very steep price. That would be one of, uh, of the highest transfer fee we have seen a, a t team uh, decided to, to get a, a guy from, from another league. And it would, once again, break the record for the, for the, the, the highest fee that the Timbers are going to spend after they just broke it uh, just this previous season with Evander. And that when you sign a guy that, I mean, I guess the other reason why, you know, number nine in terms of the price tag at, that has gone very big is when you look at some of the number nines that have signed this off season, guys like Pet, Pedro Musa and Hugo Kaifer signed for like, like um, almost eight figures amount of money. Oh, uh, that it kind of makes sense that the number nine kind of market is is very high, and especially when it comes to Liga MX team, they don't really want to sell their their player, uh, uh, except if they're they're going to hike up the prices, especially when they sell F to MLS team. I mean, a good example is of it is when when Miami got Rodolfo Pizarro. I mean, that was a really high price, and that didn't turn out well whatsoever. But you know, obviously for the Timbers, they're they're desperate in terms of getting that that DP number nine. I mean, the the the, the team so far, at least in the last two games, have shown some promise on the attacking end, but it's pretty clear that they they're, they're desperately need a DP number nine, and also not to mention having Evander back in in this team because he hasn't been played in the first two games. So we'll see whether or not if they can get the deal done of either uh, of these players in the near future. Now, Charlotte FC have also looked to sign. Sign an attacking player, and they're looking to sign Celtic winger Leo Abada. Now, from what I heard, is that you know he also is kind of a guy that hasn't really been the same uh, for for the past season or two, and maybe mainly because uh, of injuries that he has suffered that kind of shown his regression during his time with Celtic. But that being said, you know Charlotte is a team that desperately need need attacking 
firepower. I mean, after uh, both Swedetsky and Josviak left this team, they really don't have a lot of attacking talent whatsoever. And we'll see whether or not if, if they are going to sign him. And if they are going to sign him, we won't be surprised they decide to make him a DP signing and they're also hoping that he's going to be like a second coming uh, of Giorgio Yakimakis because you know talking about Yakimakis he came from Celtic and he joined Atlanta United and he he was definitely um, the the unexpected Joseph Martinez uh, replacement that Atlanta couldn't hope, hope for even uh, that Atlanta didn't, didn't expect to, to do so so well but turns out to, to, to did so well that you know it's almost like at times they didn't even miss Joseph Martinez in terms of the goal scoring protection that Yakimakis did for Atlanta. And they're hoping that Charlotte, in, in, in this case for Charlotte, is going to be hoping the same case, though, for, for this guy as well. But uh, for Nashville, there is a report that they are going to sign Hani Mukta to a, a multi-year contract extension. I won't be surprised this is going to be done in, in a matter of of days because again you know honey Mukhtar is definitely one of the more exciting number 10 in the league and he's literally the offense for nashville so i mean i'm not surprised that they're gonna lock him to a multi-year contract i mean this is just one of those deals is if if it's gonna done but when exactly is gonna be done now moving on in terms of next news and unfortunately we get into the unfortunate segment of the news of the week episode talk about injuries because um even though we're early in the season, we already have seen some backbreaking injury that some of these teams have suffered. And in the case of RSL, I hate to inform RSL fans, but Pablo Ruiz is now done for the season again uh, after he suffered a long-term knee injury in training. So that, I mean, not only the fact that he suffered a long-term injury, but to do it in, in training, I've always said this before, but when you injure yourself uh, during training, that, that just hurts even more. Because, um, you know, it's one thing to get injured, during games and that that of course sucks too but to do it in training as well i mean that that feels like a double whammy and this is also why why i've said that the reynoso uh injury with minnesota kind of hurts too because reynoso got himself injured doing during uh preseason training and he's still having a a, a appear uh for the loons in this beginning beginning of the the season but unfortunately in the case of pablo ruiz again Last season, we saw how this team just simply collapsed after uh, Pablo Ruiz uh, went down with a knee injury, and I can't imagine it's going to be be the same uh, this season as well for for RSL. I mean, there there's no doubt that they're they're going to have to look for a replacement. I mean, th this this is this is a devastating blow for for RSL, and and really a devastating blow in terms of the upside that this team uh, can can have, and that it's also also very unfortunate for for Pablo Ruiz once again suffering. This long-term knee injury. I wonder if it's going to be if it's actually the same knee that he suffered last last season after undergoing going surgery. But nevertheless, I wish him a speedy recovery. And that it sucks to see a player player to to suffer a, a long-term injury just a couple of months back and recover, and then suffer another uh, knee injury, especially in training. Nevertheless. And then more bad news in terms of injury involving the Seattle Sounders, as Brian Schmetza have said that Pedro de la Vega is going to be out six to eight weeks due to hamstring injury. And this was the concern, I think, Seattle when they decided to get Pedro de la Vega because he's been very injury riddle, even during his time with La Luz. And that now, just two games into the season, he's already out with, with a hamstring string injury and especially with the way that he has been pretty much the the spark of this this sounders attack and it's no surprise that even in the game against austin uh where i know i know seattle was was a little bit lack of daisy in terms of their finishing but he they they created a lot of chances and a lot of that has to do with pedro de la vega uh just operating at, at a tree but now that he's out for six to eight weeks because of a hamstring injury that's gonna def definitely put a huge setback to the sounders um attack and again this is this is the concern about about well uh, when the sounders decide to get pedro de la vega there's no doubt that he's a very talented player the injury issue is is is, is a bit bit of a, a risk and they're they're basically already seeing it right now just just two weeks in the season i mean I, I i expect that there was going to be time where pedro de la vega is going to miss time i didn't expect the fact that it's just going to be two games into the new season now moving on in terms of the next news and now talk about some some more better news that is not involving injuries and signings. So the Philadelphia Union, they are looking to expand Subaru Park with more seats and premium area. So this is not a big surprise because, you know, ever since the Union started to become a regular contender in the Eastern Conference, uh, Subaru Park has always been, been sold out every single game. So to kind of meet the demands, they want to 
expand the stadium. For what I heard is that when they first built the stadium, the stadium could actually expand up to 30,000 or so. And I think they can possibly maybe expand on the on the river side of the stadium. Though, you know, if they're going to do so, I hope they don't block the, the view of the Commodore Bridge because that's probably one of the coolest view uh, that any supporters can can see when they, of course, watch a Union game at, at Subaru Park. But that being said, we'll, we'll see how... Uh, what they do increase their their the capacity and also not to mention adding more premium area uh the stadium is kind of built near near the end of the mls 2.0 era kind of stadium this is kind of before when these these uh stadiums that is built in mls are just f so futuristic look and look so 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 nice but you know the union are looking to to try to up Take that and we'll see what they're going to do do and we'll see what's going to be the new capacity I, i'm assuming if they do expand it it's going to be at least twenty thousand plus and then uh nashville sc so they are now facing backlash after selling seated supporter section uh seats for away fans and also the high tickets prices against inter miami now obviously the high tickets prices against inter miami it's not a surprise because anytime when a team play against inter miami when they're the, the home team it's going to be be high in terms of the ticket prices because of Messi and friends coming to to visit and there's even a rumor that it seems like Messi and Suarez might not even be playing in the game against Na Nashville but the whole backlash of course is selling the 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 tickets uh some of the seated supporter section to away fans now it's kind of a bit misleading because you know some of the seats that they're they're selling is in the section that's kind of on the outer ring of the supporter section but as Nashville SC fans have pointed out and and especially, I actually did a little research of that. That in terms of Geodas Park, in terms of the seating charge, the the section that they're still selling seats to general public, they label that as, still as part of the supporter section. So, yeah, that can be very interesting, especially from what I also heard from Nashville fans. You know, those section that they're selling tickets uh, to a anyone. You know, they're 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 all they are considered to be maybe on the outer ring of the supporter section, but it's not like it's it's blocked off or anything. There's no no railing that that blocks off the supporter section. Basically, they're kind of like sitting right next uh, to to each other. So yeah, I don't think that's gonna go so so well. Uh, what's uh, if that is is the case? And that again, I'm not surprised that that uh, national fans are absolutely fuming. About this, and I don't blame them because you should not be see, seeing fans decide to sell sell tickets to to section that is near the supporter section, and especially if it's not blocked off near the supporter section to any anybody. Because imagine if there's a way fans that is like right next to the supporter section. There's a reason why why MOS team don't do that, and a reason why MOS team will ne have a pol policy where in the supporter section they do not allow uh, a way fan fans and away fans uh away teams color in their section because it's a dedicated dedicated uh supporter uh section that is dedicated to the fans of the home team so this is not gonna go so so well i wonder how the security is going 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 to be i mean the security's gotta be be, be pretty good if this is going to be be the the ca case because i will not be surprised there could be 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 some some extra curricular activity in the stands if this of course is going to be be the case especially why in the world would you decide to sell general uh seats to to fans uh next to the supporter section or at least on your your website it's still part of the the supporter section when basically basically on your your website and also from at least the, all the supporter group uh from nashville and the back line have have literally says that they do not allow away fans and any uh away team color in their supporter section but on a more positive note, NYCFC have released new rendering of the new stadium that they're going to be building. And actually, I'm going to see if I can uh, give you guys some image of it. And one of the image that they, of course, shown is like this cube kind of looking thing. Actually, this is kind of like one of the image of it. So, yeah, this, of course, it's it's kind of like a like a cube that they, of course, of course, ha ha have put. It's, it looks very very nice. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the the Halo that we saw with with Barclays uh Stadium or Barclays Arena. Or I think it's called Barclays Center that the Brooklyn Nets uh are are doing. And I like like that design. I always love to see some unique feature in some of these new stadiums because some some of these new stadiums they look starting to look a little bit gen generic uh compared to to other stadium and that I do like that NYCFC decided to do something very uh unique. 
Again, this is uh, the other new rendering. And then, of course, this is kind of like the inside, which uh, they showed that they're actually winning 2-1 against Inter Miami. Though, I guarantee you that by then, uh, they're, they're, uh, when the stadium is all open, when they face against Inter Miami, probably Messi and his friends is not going to be uh, there anymore. So, that, it kind of makes sense that they were winning 2-1 against Inter Miami. And maybe kind of a preview of the fact that that might be the scoreline heading into to the the future as well but yeah it's definitely the the nice that they release some new rendering and that again the hype to around uh that the opening of the stadium is definitely at an all-time high i'm very happy to see that nycfc finally got their stadium issue has done and especially uh getting a a, a stadium and solving this issue in new york city which is probably one of the toughest places to 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 able to plot a new stadium yeah, it's great that they, of course, do that, and this is also kind of pressure some some teams, especially uh, that team about 200 miles north of where where NYCFC play in New England. That the pressure is definitely on them to to build themselves a new soccer specific stadium as well. And then finally, uh, in terms of the power rankings, so again, you know, every single week in the news, the week episode, I'll mention the power rankings, but I won't talk about exactly uh, what I feel about that because you know me in terms of my opinions with power rankings. But at number one, uh, we still have the defending MLS Cup champion, that is the Columbus Crew. But we did have Inter Miami moving into second position, followed by Cincinnati in third position. Then we have the Galaxy moving all the way up to fourth position, uh, I mean, actually ahead of LAFC. I mean, it's been a while since we have seen the Galaxy are ahead of LAFC in the power rankings, but that is the case uh, this week. Then we have the Philadelphia Union dropping to six plays, and the same goes for the Seattle Sounders dropping to to seven place then we got Atlanta United in eighth place the New York Red Bulls now climbing all the way up to ninth place and we also saw Minnesota climbing all the way up to 10th place and I believe Minnesota was the biggest mover in terms of this week of our ranking which is kind of a surprise because yes I get it they they got a a big uh, resort against Columbus at home, especially the the last minute winner, and especially with the way that this team pretty much uh, was injured to hell on the attacking end, and we were relying on kids to hope to get them a resort, and they got got the the resort right at the death. I did not expect that they were the team that was the biggest mover, and especially I don't think there's been a time where where a team that that uh, is the biggest mover in the power rankings um, didn't even get get a win on 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 the 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 week that they were considered to be the biggest mover but i guess this is just mos basically just letting letting minnesota fan know that hey we still we still love you we we're not gonna we gotta make sure we we at least accommodate you so that that later on they they uh they won't actually uh blame on the media that they're underrating them again and especially i guess maybe they're they're fearing that they're gonna be another uh second coming of adrian Heath basically once again labeling that, oh, this MLSsoccer.com kind of media has no idea what they're talking about and kind of are, are underrating our team again, even though, obviously, I don't think that's going to be be the, the case and anymore, especially with the league really uh, getting them them now into the top 10, even though they didn't even win this weekend. But there you have it. That is pretty much it in terms of looking at these news that has happened in the past week. As always, let me know in the comments below what do you think of these news and if there's any news I didn't mention here on the board and because I'm doing this relatively early. I guarantee there's going to be some news I didn't mention here on the board. But let me know in the comments below, as always. But yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you like, smash the subscribe button. And yeah, I, of course, will see you guys next time.